we need to sing that song every week anyway because uh, we are all his children and we all need to come to know him more closely so it's appropriate irregardless of my goodness all the kids I noticed when I searched for this book, we have done this both in 2014 and 2019, but I thought since we just finished our other story and I picked up the cross that we would do it for the next three Wednesdays, or last Wednesday and two more before Easter, select chapters from John Stott's The Cross. Uh, this week, we'll talk about uh, satisfaction for sin and the fact that uh, God paid a ransom for our lives. And so that will be, and then uh, not this week, but Friday after next, we will have a good Friday service at seven o'clock here in the sanctuary. wanted to talk a little bit about Passover and bring the connection in with New Testament and uh, the fact that Jesus is our Passover lamb. But let's look in the uh, scripture lesson in Exodus chapter 12. Exodus 12, 21 through 28. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it into the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and to the two doorposts and not None of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the little and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come to your houses to smite you. And he shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. And when you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall observe this rite. And when your children say to you, what does this rite mean to you? You shall say, it is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians that spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshipped. And then the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. And now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn of the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn cattle. And now in the New Testament, the book of Romans, in the middle of passage where first three chapters of Romans, where Paul is discussing the fact that we're all sinners. Romans chapter 2, the first 11 verses. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God falls rightly upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, 
when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same thing yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and the tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourselves in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. There will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, of the Jew first and also of the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. May God bless the reading of his word. And let's look to the Lord in prayer as we begin. We thank you, our God, for the lessons we learned from these scriptures. We thank you for you made a way for the Israelites to escape the wrath of the angel and the punishment of Egypt. We thank you that you have made a way through us, uh, even though we're all sinners and fall short of your glory. That through Jesus our Savior, we have redemption through his blood that he shed on the cross for us. Thank you in his name. Amen. Next Sunday morning is uh, Palm Sunday, begins Passover week. Uh, and it's no coincidence as we look to Passover week and a Good Friday service. We're still not going to have Monday, Thursday, and eat together, but we are going to have a Good Friday service. That it's no coincidence the death of Christ on the cross, his suffering, the beating on the Thursday evening and into Friday morning, and then his death on Friday afternoon, what we call Good Friday is approximately the same time that the Passover lambs were slain in the nation of Israel, and that was the custom. It's also no coincidence that that weekend is when all of this took place on the anniversary of the Passover. Many Jews were in Jerusalem, and the timing of God's plan was immaculate. And we just read uh, Exodus 12, how the Passover was originated, and the children of Israel were to keep that Passover uh, as a memorial of their redemption, like we celebrate communion as a memorial of what Christ did for us. As I mentioned, we are going to be studying Wednesday evening the satisfaction for sin and ransom by God. But I um, had read in this chapter and looked and uh, sort of the convergence of things. I can try think uh, John Scott, Charles Spurgeon, and Tracy for this today, because uh, the Spurgeon quote you may have seen posted on our webpage and from John Scott here, and the song that Tracy picked out, Come Ye Sinners, Poor and Needy. Those things all sort of came to mind as we look at this today. Um, in Scott's book, The Cross, uh, the chapter today is about sin and forgiveness 
and Spot entitles the chapter, The Problem of Forgiveness. I rather think of not being a problem of forgiveness because God forgives us freely and has made a way for us. It's rather the problem of sin and the need for forgiveness and more than that, a need for a savior. But let me read to you briefly what Scott says and why he says it's a problem of forgiveness. Many people are bewildered by Christian insistence that according to the gospel, the cross of Christ is the only ground on which God forgives sin. Why does God not simply forgive us without the necessity of the cross? Nobody's death is necessary before we forgive each other. It sounds like a primitive superstition that modern people should long since discard it. The reason why many people give the wrong answers to the question about the cross and even ask the wrong question is they have not carefully considered the seriousness of sin or the majesty of God. We need to understand the seriousness of sin and the majesty of God. And although it's true, it's, it was true in Bible times, and it's true today as well. But I think of it as we look together today, it's not a problem of forgiveness, rather it's a problem of sin. If we look in Romans 3.23, in Romans 5, 8 through 10, Paul puts it this way. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Doesn't leave room for a certain group of people. But it's pointed out in the first three chapters of Romans that it applies, the falling short applies to all sorts of groups of people. In um, in Romans 1, 18 through 32, Paul addresses a pagan, depraved Greek society. And although we don't have a Greek society, we certainly have pagan, humanistic people in our world today. He addresses in chapter 2, verses 1 through 16, what could be called critical moralizers, people that are self-righteous and think they're pretty good people and they haven't done much wrong, so and they moralize over others. And then he addresses in Romans 2, chapter 2, verse 17 through chapter 3, verse 8, self-confident Jews. And although we don't have many Jewish people around here, certainly we do have people that would be considered pharisaical or legalist. And so Paul addresses these three groups of people and confronts them all with their sin. Now, the word for sin in the Greek is harmartia. And it appears in the New Testament probably over 200 times, and there are 33 or more derivatives of the sin. But mainly the word harmartia means this, to miss the mark, to miss the mark. And it was originally a technical term concerned with archery. They did archery in the ancient Greek world, probably as part of an Olympic sport from the Greek Olympics. But missing the mark came from the idea of missing the target or not hitting the target in the center um, in archery. Sin can also mean seeking autonomy from God, not relying on God, seeking to be autonomous, such as Adam and Eve in the garden when God had given them a commandment and they took the advice of the serpent instead. 
Uh, it also can be deliberate actions of disobedience, or it can simply be um, accidentally doing the wrong thing. All of that can be and is considered sin. But most of all, sin is falling short of the glory of God. And Paul addresses three different groups of people in the first three chapters of Romans. But does God have a remedy for that? We know from John 3.16 that God sent his only son into the world to be our savior, not to condemn us, to save us from our sins. In Romans, the fifth chapter, verses 8 through 10, Paul puts it this way, or 6 through 10. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were yet enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And we rejoice that Christ not only gave his life and died, but he rose again, and he will bring, when he comes back again, he will bring eternal life. We see in the first three chapters of Romans the commonality of all groups. Many people in our world, we may not have the same breakdown of groups, but we can certainly see the different groups of people. We can see heathens that don't have any understanding of who God is or seek after God at all. We can see the self-righteous people who look down on others. We can see the pharisaical type people. But Paul says in our scripture lesson, in the first three verses of Romans 2, that there's no excuse. Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which, which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But you just, do you suppose, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things, and do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God. So, large or small, we think sometimes in terms of little sins and big sins, and we pass judgment on people who we consider to be big sinners, and we think that we just make little mistakes, but we miss the mark and we fall short of God's glory. What we need to understand, and hopefully we need to show other people, is the fact that it doesn't matter. There's no little sins and big sins in God's eyes. We all fall short of God's glory. But God has made a way through Jesus Christ, his Son. And as we approach Holy Week and Good Friday and then Resurrection Sunday, we need to understand and we need to be cognizant of the fact that God made a way for us. There's many in our world that don't recognize or who simply fail to acknowledge their need for a Savior. But we all need a Savior. I trust most of us here today, or all of us here today, have realized the need for a Savior and have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And that's a good thing. But we need to be cognizant of the fact 
There's many, many people in our world that don't recognize their need for a Savior. We must be about not only living the life, but showing others the good news of who Jesus is and what he's done for us. We need to model the behavior that shows others about Jesus Christ and leads them to want to seek the same Savior as we have. And finally, as we live in that manner and as we show others their need for a Savior and their need for repentance, I trust that we can all pray this prayer for ourselves or this quote from Stott, or excuse me, this quote from, quote from Charles Spurgeon who I thought was appropriate as a prayer. May God give you grace to see sin as it really is. Sin as it really is in his sight. For then you will realize your need of a Savior. I trust this morning that all of us here today have already seen our need for a Savior. And we acknowledge Jesus Christ as our Savior. We worship him and we seek to show him to others. But I thought the words of Spurgeon were very appropriate for those of us who have friends, loved ones, associates, people we care about very much that for some reason or another don't see a need for a Savior. If you could pray anything for these people, pray that God will show them his grace, that they will understand that they are sinners and they need a Savior. And hopefully the Spirit of God will lead them to a knowledge of Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. May God bless this teaching this morning.